the Institutogram conversation with me, Sajjad. From the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. Today I will be in conversation with um, my friend uh, Muhammad Azad Poor, who uh, is a professor of philosophy at uh, San Francisco State University. And in particular, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about his uh, new book, uh, Analytic Philosophy and Avicenna. Hi. Uh, Salam alaikum. Uh, how, are you? how are you, my friend? Good, thank you. Uh, and good, well, good morning to you. Good evening to us. Um, good to have you with us. And that, that was morning. remarkably smooth. Um, let me just uh, f kind of finish a couple of my, uh, <laughs> my introductory uh, comments just by saying that uh, I mentioned we'll be talking about your book. Um, I think it'll be useful if I, if I mention your previous book, uh, which came out in 2011 called Reason Unbound, uh, which um, is actually linked and we can, we can talk about how it, it is linked. Uh, but it was particularly... Uh, a, a reading of Avicenna, which was trying to make sense of the sort of ethical commitments involved uh, in uh, Avicenna's uh, project, and uh, was also making some interesting connections with things which I'm very much interested in, which is uh, philosophy as a way of life, uh, very much uh, influenced by the late uh, Pierre Addo. Uh, so, talking about your new book, and... Um, I think it might be useful just to get us started by asking you the really obvious question, which is why did you write this book? Um, and in particular, why, why, <laughs> why the, the analytic philosophical tradition in Avicenna? Thank you, uh, Sajjad, for uh, having me uh, in your uh, uh, program. And um, <clears throat> I uh, uh, like to say first that uh, uh, yes, I, I've had uh, over the many years since my f the first publication of um, the when Reason Unbound first came out, uh, I've been in conversation with you on a number of topics of mutual interest. Uh, and of course, uh, Pierre Hadot uh, and his influence on our reading of uh, uh, pre-modern traditions is, is uh, uh, paramount. And I think also we shouldn't leave unsaid the uh, influence of uh, uh, Corban in, uh, in shaping uh, that connection. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I, uh, the new uh, uh, book that I've uh, out, I, I've had some um, references to concerns in that already in, uh, in Reason Unbound, uh, 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 where I uh, uh, brought in... Uh, uh, John McDowell on, on several occasions to make some of the arguments that I wanted to make. Uh, I, uh, uh, of course, uh, finished my PhD in uh, the U.S. And, uh, and I was, when I was a graduate student, uh, very interested in, in uh, uh, the philosophical pragmatism uh, practiced by... Um, uh, people like uh, Wilfred Sellers and, and his school, nowadays they call them the Pittsburgh School. And, um, and I, uh, <clears throat> within that kind of uh, hub of interest that I also developed uh, uh, a, a, some work on Islamic philosophy. And I, has, I have been always, you know, interested in how I can, you know, uh, in a more uh, um, straightforward and, and uh, intelligible way, uh, broach those, you know, vastly disparate traditions, uh, what it looks like to be a vastly disparate traditions. And it took me a long time uh, to make it, you know, just sort of in, accessible in such a way that, uh, 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 that you know, um, people from both traditions can, can sort of uh, benefit from it. So that's um, sort of a biogra uh, uh, autobiographical way, but you know we can talk about the content some more. Um, sure. Like. Um, I mean, before we get to the content, can you say something more about, um, I guess, the label analytic in this in this context? Because um, you know, um, uh, I mean, we talked about this the other day as well. Uh, 
uh, when when people started talking uh, about how we need to take um, Islamic philosophy, I mean, let's just call it Islamic philosophy at the moment, um, yes. more seriously as philosophy, then it was often said that, well, um, the especially for the later schools of Islamic philosophy, you know, people like Mullah Sadr, etc., yes. Uh, the, the the proper kind of context or the proper dialogue that can happen can only really happen with the continental tradition. Um, mm. Because there was something, I guess, uh, about the restrictive nature, perhaps, of the analytic tradition, mm. which meant that there wasn't um, a clear um, ground, an extensive ground for comparison, right? So what you needed to mm. do is you needed to do these kind of Heidegger and Mullah Sadra kind of comparative works. Mm of which, as you know, there are, I think, at least three books out there, if not more, on precisely this issue. And, uh, uh, you know, trying to find a language. Now, what I find interesting, what you're doing is that you're, you're saying that actually uh, we don't necessarily need to do that and we need mm -hmm. to maybe rethink how we understand this label analytic. Uh, yeah. And perhaps the analytic yeah. tradition is not as, as simple and... Uh, as simplistic as it's been made out to be by those who want yeah, to miss yeah. it easily. Um, so mm. I, I think this, this term analytic is interesting because, y as you know, there's this recent book which came out called Islamic Analytic Philosophy. There's a, a growing interest amongst yes. analytic philosophers to make sense of Avicenna. You know, I mentioned to you there's this reading group on Avicenna at, at Princeton, which is predominantly analytic philosophers. So. Um, if you yes. could say a bit more about this label analytic and how you think that dialogue, which you, I mean, you mentioned it as a dialogue, how it works. Yeah. 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 So now it's, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. You know, uh, uh, people have tried to uh, uh, articulate what analytic philosophy means. And, and uh, oftentimes I think superficially they, you know, of course, uh, people kind of like uh, demarcate philosophy, you know, um, geographically you know there's the you know european continental anglo-american nowadays because of course you know uh you know the british are trying to separate from the uh the the eurozone and uh and that sort of makes that i mean there's a philosophical predecessor to that so there's um uh so there's that that kind of superficial demarcation um <clears throat> I, I think that uh, um, uh, what I try to do in this book, I mean, I begin it really by this uh, passage uh, from Wilfred Sellers. He says, the history of philosophy is the lingua franca, which makes communication between philosophers, at least of different points of view possible. Philosophy, the history of philosophy, if not empty or blind, is at least dumb. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very strong uh, sort of like uh, uh, endorsement of thinking historically about philosophy, which I think is really what makes uh, continental philosophy more friendly uh, to people who are trained in Islamic philosophy, who have an interest in Islamic mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, and, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, history of philosophy has often, I don't want to say always, and, and uh, not consistently throughout, has been something that has been uh, underestimated uh, uh, in uh, analytic philosophy uh, programs. Mm -hmm. um, the focus being much more on a sort of a thematic topical approach to philosophy, which, is, which has this value. But, uh, you know, like Avicenna doesn't do much history of philosophy when, when you read his texts. You know, it's uh, very sparse in his... Uh, references to his predecessors and, and so on. Uh, so there's, you know, but, but I think more and more, and I think in this tradition that I focus on the Salarzian, Salarzian tradition, uh, you have uh, much more of an interest, a robust interest in history of philosophy and uh, the kind of uh, uh, movement, uh, kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pragmatism, well, you might say neo-pragmatism. It, it's... Um, traces itself strongly to Kant um, mm. and, and works extensively on Hegel. And, and, uh, and so there is a, a, a deep interest in history of philosophy, at least modern traditions. And, 
and 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 it wasn't difficult for me then to sort of like argue well you know we could go pre-modern too and some of the uh, scholars that are now within this circle that i work uh, on um including say john mcdowell is used to be in a in a previous sort of career uh, specialist in ancient philosophy mm. so there are there are some um uh, historical interests and of course they uh, so th that's that made the that tradition much more um, uh, uh, sort of available for an engagement with um, uh, Islamic philosophy, uh, right. especially classical yeah. Islamic philosophy. Yeah. Um, but you know, as yeah. you know, the the more uh, the later traditions and, and and so on. I mean, my view is that they're just as rich, if not richer, for this kind of engagement. But you know, you had to narrow down uh, uh, for well, this work, um, but yeah. I, I mean, one of the problems, of course, we have is, is translations. I mean, if, you're, if we want to talk uh, to and engage with, with philosophers, and, and of course you were a philosopher in the philosophy department, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you can't do that without translations of these texts. And um, it, it's right. still the case that there are very few texts which have been translated. And, and I would say translated in, in a way which actually makes any sense to most philosophers. Um, I, I've spoken to mm -hmm. friends who are analytic philosophers and I sometimes show them some of this stuff and they say, I have absolutely no idea what's going on here. Um, and, and partly it's, it's the way in which things are written, but it's also because some of the translations are so bad. <laughs> so we have a <laughs> the task uh, there. And, um, um, and, and the patience is so low on the part of our... Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if, at the end of the day, if you're going to be, uh, you know, assigning texts to be used in the classroom, you need to be, mm, well, you yeah. need to have the texts. And secondly, you need to have the confidence that these texts are usable in the classroom. Yeah. Uh, and I right. think that's the, that's the big challenge that we have. Sure, sure. No, I, I, I agree. And, and I think that, um, you know, I... Um, have been teaching uh, a sort of an introductory level Islamic philosophy course for, you know, something like 20 years now. And um, my um, imp impression has been that, uh, that if you want to generate a, a genuine interest in, in that tradition, um, just by throwing at them bits of, uh, uh, say, Avicenna's metaphysics, um, uh, or some some somewhat more uh, religious texts um, or 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 allegorical uh, allegorical uh, texts like Ibn Tufail's or Ghazali's, you know, um, it's going to be hard to create a, you know a a relationship with the student who is um, you know trained in in Anglo American or even continental. Uh, traditions of philosophy. And that's why, you know, in in, a, in my first book and and the one that you mentioned already, Reason Unbound, I I try to generate this this sort of well, let's start with you know like concerns with ethics and how to to lead the good life. Mm. And you see that even though we don't have too many translations of relevant texts um, uh, in English, um, uh, there are still some, and they they can you know, situate this concern uh, for our students. And, and, and that's why I think um, it may not, I mean, so that's, that's another thing that is sort of difficult because immediately people go um, to complex metaphysical epistemological arguments and, and, and they're, they're rich too, but the, the audience is not yet situated on how to understand what, you know, um, say Avicenna, um, yeah. Before, uh, if they don't have that kind of like uh, orientation. Okay, so um, so let, let's talk about your book then. <laughs> I mean, sure. Um, how how do you think in the book you're orienting a reader towards Avicen? I mean, like how are you contextual? I I know you begin with Mino's paradox. Um, and mm. which, of course, is like a huge question. Um, mm. And um, uh, and perhaps, I, I, you know, I should ask you to say what Mina's paradox is as well. So that everyone <laughs> knows what we're talking about. Um, let me, I, let me yeah, bring my PowerPoint slides. Yeah, 
Shall we, let, <laughs> shall we start with that? Let, let's start with, um, you know, of, of Mino's paradox and, and then how you, you use that as the, the starting point for what you're presenting. Yeah. Uh. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of the, um, uh, the special moves that uh, um, Sellers makes then that, that is picked up uh, uh, later by um, his successors is to argue that uh, uh, episodes of knowing yeah. um, are, are not to be justified or grounded uh, uh, through kind of our desc descriptive moves. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, a knowing can only be uh, justified by another episode of knowing. That is, uh, um, uh, he, he then has this special terminology, the space of reasons, knowing is an episode or state in the space of reasons. Um, and um, <clears throat> and so, so any attempt to kind of uh, try to ground our, our uh, knowledge or our beliefs by um, uh, non-conceptual episodes, like just frictional contact, uh, uh, with the world through our sensory organs, or whatever the kind of uh, uh, moves that are uh, that were popular in empiricism, um, that's not uh, uh, legitimate for um, um, sellers. He calls it a naturalistic fallacy, mm. um, or, or on par with Moore's naturalistic fallacy. Yeah. Um, but then he 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 still wants to argue that there are these kind of like uh, uh, grounding. Uh, um, sort of conceptual episodes that, that anchor our, our, our uh, uh, knowledge uh, to, the, to the world. Um, but he doesn't think that miraculously and, and just causally and then acquire a rational authority just uh, uh, by virtue of their acquisition in, a, in, in this kind of causal way, but that they need to, to be placed within the space of reasons. Mm. And I thought that, you know, and I've been teaching, you know, for a long time and, and reading and thinking about it, that the paradox in the Mino, at least one aspect of it, uh, it's a complex uh, uh, as, uh, the, uh, argument. Uh, one aspect of it is that, um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, it's called the paradox of discovery. At Mino asks Socrates, um, if I don't know something, mm -hmm. um, how do I uh, gain knowledge about it? Um, it? It just seems to be, you know, uh, uh, I mean, that's part of his rhetorical ploy, but Socrates takes that very seriously. And he doesn't say something like, well, you know, you know a little bit, and then you learn some more. Um, and, and that's what it is. I mean, that's sort of, you know, maybe like the paradox of inquiry way of dealing with, with this this dilemma that Mino you know, uh, launches, um, he argues that there, for there to be any knowledge, there's got to be um, foreknowledge, yeah. right? uh, pre-existent knowledge. Uh, you can't arrive at knowledge without having knowledge already, which is kind of circular. But I think it's, I, I try to construe it in the book in line uh, with Sellers' attempt to kind of avoid what he calls the myth of the given. And mm. I said, well, look, it's already a version of it there. So um, uh, it is interesting to see um, how uh, uh, philosophers in pre-modern traditions, especially in this case, Plato, Aristotle, and Avicenna, um, uh, sort of respond to, to uh, uh, Socrates' solution. And it turns out that they all, in some way or another, want to endorse a kind of pre-existent uh, uh, knowledge or, or mm. foreknowledge. And, and they are insistent that you cannot arrive at knowledge through just some sort of contingent transaction with the world in the way, say, advocates of um, the myth of the given would want. Mm. Um, so <clears throat> the, the interesting thing is that, so for uh, Socrates, and I assume to some extent for Plato, uh, um, there's, uh, um, you know, some uh, modification in, in Plato's accounts that goes beyond what Socrates says in the Mino, um, or Socrates has been you know, sort of assigned to say in the Mino. Yeah. Um, but in any event, there is the foreknowledge it turns out to be something that we are born with. 
and and in some sense we apprehend in uh, in a in a kind of innate you might say way although yeah. i i qualify that i think that's there's some uh, nuance there um <clears throat> but th- what is interesting is and i think this is sort of less noticed that uh, um aristotle in his posterior analytics in the sort of the appendix the section 2 uh, uh uh to it adopts or 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 uh, revives the discussion of um uh plato's meno and and challenges the socratic answer mm-hmm. and instead of the um <clears throat> Uh, the the kind of pre-existent or foreknowledge that we have uh innately as it were he argues it's an experience right yeah um and that was like wow i mean i thought i thought then i then i was said well avicenna obviously uh is is you know uh and and i started looking and 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 yeah of course he's he's interested in 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 uh in aristotle's uh, uh, uh account and of course he wants to uh develop that and and refine that in a way that that he does typically with his uh um aristotelian um uh, uh uh inheritance and uh so um so i i'll just cut it short if you want but i think that's yeah. that's where i went in trying okay. to make that connection right so that's that's what that's where you're coming from that's the kind of the basis of the i guess the connection and 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 particularly i mean once once you you say that you're you're trying to deal with this issue of you know how you know this is like uh anyone who looks at tries to make sense of what philosophy might mean globally that one of the first things they say is well philosophy concerns itself with how we know things right mm-hmm. how, how do we move from a position of of ignorance i guess to a position of knowledge uh that's one of, and of course and the other i, I guess uh, hook your placing is this kind of celersian uh, conception of of how that works uh, and its reception and and um, in certain forms of pragmatism within the yeah. the i guess maybe the post analytic tradition uh, <laughs> we might call it yes mm-hmm. but then uh, so how do you develop that i, I mean um, uh, what is uh, for someone who hasn't read the book but of course everyone should go out and get the book and read it and at the very least should encourage libraries to buy it um what um what what is the take home i mean i you know what is the result of your inquiry uh, mm-hmm. of your juxtaposition of sellers mcdowell and and avicenna what what's your finding um yes yeah, so it, there are a number of uh, uh conclusions i i think that um uh, uh one of the um sort of advantages uh I'm doing this for someone who's a scholar of Avicenna uh, or or Islamic philosophy um uh is to be able to articulate a a um a kind of a a, a reasonable uh view that that sort of uh helps us navigate between sort of disconcerting or problematic interpretations of um uh avicenna's epistemology you know uh we have uh, uh you know uh, empir- uh, people who read avicenna as a, as a as an empiricist or as a sort of like a, a predecessor to locke um yeah. uh, and then there are of course a wide range of people who read avicenna as an, as 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 uh, um espousing a kind of uh, em- emanatism um mm-hmm. Uh, an, an emanation view of uh, that that the sort of knowledge is through some kind of inspiration uh, by the active intellect and has nothing to do with the sort of preparatory empirical encounters with the world and uh, the view that i uh, uh, pose kind of steers of course in between the the charybdis and the scylla as it were and uh, and 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 you know I, tries to in some sense reconcile you know the the empiricist evidence with with the kind of the emanatist uh, mm. uh, evidence and i think that um uh, uh that's one of the the results of the uh, uh the work <clears throat> mm. uh there is uh, uh, uh there's some uh, some implications for uh the uh, salarzian neo pragmatism as well looking at avicenna i think it brings into view a kind of a, a worry about the uh, 
the kind of uh, uh, naturalism or uh, um, or even like the uh, to take into an ex to a limit the scientism that that sort of um, uh, uh, haunts this this uh, philosophical tradition right. um, and and it sort of helps us dismantle that so that's another mm -hmm. one there are a number of uh, um, uh, uh, fruits that emerge from this this yeah. uh, but these are the two I think prominent ones right I mean I think that's useful because um, you know that that suggests um, you know, that there's take home for those who do work on, on Avicenna, right? Um, perhaps yes. purely within the study of Islamic thought or, or within um, medieval Islamic mm -hmm. philosophy. And then there's a take home for, um, uh, for analytic um, philosophers. I, I guess the, yeah. if, if one was going to, to play devil's advocate for a second, right? Um, I mean, someone would might. Say I was that, worried about that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so someone might say, "Look, um, the Avicenna people um, don't really need this because it's not really speaking to their concerns." And um, is there really anything that this kind of post Salesian tradition really can learn from Avicenna? I mean, could could they not come to these conclusions depend, independently of? Um, what your your kind of intervention of Avicenna within this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so you could say, and I and I, in a way, I use a, a, a phrase or or or, or a term, um, uh, perennial philosophy yeah. in in the work. Um, um, my my argument is that uh, we have gone. And this is something I've been worried about uh, in the past in this kind of uh, historicizing of the of, of philosophy. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not against, uh, I actually uh, promote strongly an engagement with the history of philosophy, but I, to historicize philosophy is, is a different um, issue. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, uh, my, my uh, um, sort of uh, hope with this work is not so much that Look, um, none of these uh, um, uh, philosophers and scholars uh, uh, could do without um, uh, without this work uh, mm -hmm. in the way I have tried to make the uh, uh, the connection. But yeah. um, my my view is actually that by seeing the, these kinds of engagement, we get to move past the kind of relativizing historicizing uh and 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 sort of uh um you know uh, uh making philosophy a, a kind of um um uh, part of this na natural science uh concern which is a different issue than the other two that i mentioned but all of these i think they kind of narrow the range of uh, um philosophy and and i think that uh, um that but the so the point is not that I am somehow um, uh, pushing the boundaries the, uh, the 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 envelope of of philosophy in ways uh, that it has not done has not gone before. But my aim is to sort of bring that bring that into view, given the way we kind of narrow and constrain our our um, our engagements with philosophy nowadays. Yeah, so I, I think more part modest of, yeah. proposal. I mean, part of it, I think, is is, is a very important, um, you know, question of of what sort of language you use to communicate ideas and arguments. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's also interesting that I I um, I mean I, I mentioned when we were talking the other day, um, um, Sari Nuseba's new book, and I, again I was flicking through it, and and I, I realized in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, there's some interesting overlap with your work um, mm. because both of them basically do deal with this fundamental question of really, how do we know things? Right. And, and yes. what Avicenna can say to speak to, but um, his, um, his solution is, is radically different <laughs> and, and not just radically different. It's, it's kind of, it's really surprising. Um, and it also explains why he calls it Oriental philosophy because he, he basically seems to come he, to this position. Appeal. Yeah. Well, I mean, he comes to this position, which is the, you know, in which we, we look and understand the world. 
the fact that it may correspond to some reality um mm. for him is entirely providential um it's it's like it's like a form of pragmatism mm. almost that you know the overlap the mm. correspondence of them is 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 coincidental in in that sort of pragmatic mm. sense but it's also providential and he basically comes up with mm. this idea that uh that suggests that the metaphysics is the key so without the metaphysics in which everything stems from god and god's necessity and the contingency of everything else nothing works mm-hmm. even the epistemology doesn't work so ultimately mm-hmm. um he's suggesting that if you take the existence of god out of the equation um mm-hmm. ultimately you can't have any sort of justified belief about anything mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and that seems to be a very radical position which i suspect mm-hmm. most analytic philosophers will not be terribly help, um, mm-hmm. happy about mm-hmm. um but yeah is in person yeah so i i i actually looked yeah. um yeah yeah no so, yeah go ahead yeah so i actually looked uh, through some of his arguments um since we spoke last and uh and yeah i mean i think um you know he ends up uh um uh, uh supporting or endorsing a kind of amenatist reading of of avicenna in the final as a strong amenatism yeah um and um and you the know whole, and, the whole and, intellect the whole intellect yeah and 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 so it's not unusual i mean he does because of the language and all that and but yeah. there there are others who have advanced that and and maybe he by appealing to so called oriental um yeah. text uh the the missing oriental text and and he wants to in some sense um uh, you know uh find reason to perhaps add that strong predicate to emanatism yeah. that make yeah. make it yeah uh and, and and of course you know i you know we have talked about this before i i i do believe that um avicenna is 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 properly categorized in under islamic philosophy there's there is a there is something called islamic philosophy in which philosophy sort of uh lives comfortably within sort of islamic uh par- parameters and and um it's not so hard to understand that uh uh given you know the assumption that philosophy is a way of life and mm-hmm. and, and you know so uh so there is that uh i mean I, there there is some sympathy with uh sorry you know saiba's uh uh moves in in from my uh perspective um but yeah i i don't uh agree with that extreme or 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 strong amenatist reading i think that uh um empiricism is uh or empiricist uh, uh assumptions are also taken up in that kind of aristotelian way in in avicenna and then that uh um it's a you know it's you know this combination that um is there so that's that's if you don't mind me I just uh, but no. but go ahead and 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 finish your thought I I just wanted to throw that in there No I I was I was just saying that you know I I it was just striking that it seemed that you were both kind of grappling with a similar problem but coming out with a quite a distinct solution um yes. and um um and yet it's interesting because the language he uses and a lot of the the actual content of the book um mm. is is heavily engaged with i guess what you might call a, a an older tradition of analytic philosophy or philosophy mm. of language yeah. uh sure, whereas sure. whereas you are engaging with this sort of a sellers mcdowell tradition but also um i think also engaging with some of the traditions of how we we look at islamic philosophy i mean you you talked about qobah and others as well so mm. it, it, in some ways it's like it's like your path is a more mixed one and ends mm. with one which doesn't necessarily perhaps involve a theological cop out right <laughs> whereas his is a much no more i i i hope not in but... which he does seem to end up with a theological cop out which i i find interesting um <laughs> i i mean well, that could be a strong... selling point for my work if you don't want a theological cop out read my book well i i would have thought that if you want a analytic philosophers <laughs> to read it uh, you don't want to be saying that uh, we can't know anything if if god doesn't exist um, i think that would be um uh that would be uh, a, a a a well, difficult I mean, sell sure uh so there's i mean there there's an important dimension to 
uh, Avicenna's uh, um, uh, account of God as the necessary existent in his metaphysics, uh, as you know. I don't need to, um, this is to uh, preach to the converted. Uh, so um, there, there, there is a central place in Aristotle, in Avicenna's ontology for God. Um, and he, he and he's not just assuming it in in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, he is, you know, this is something that you know that he kind of demonstrates, if you will. Uh, uh, and uh, and so um, and, and and of course, um, this is not to say that he's he's an act, he's, he's against uh, connecting that notion of God to. Uh, the Abrahamic God, and I think you know he has no problem with you know uh, making that connection. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, so um, yeah, it is important for him. I, I'm not uh, advocating a reading of Avicenna or or an understanding of Avicenna as as that kind of like uh, uh, Straussian um, you know philosopher who is uh, hiding behind the garb of religion to avoid charges of heresy, but, you know, but deep down he's a heretic and, and you know, any chance he gets, he's got a bottle of wine, you know, he's yeah. sending it down and, 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 you know, being heretical and whatever. <laughs> I, I think that uh, that's, not, that's not a right reading, correct reading yeah. of, of uh, Avicenna or any other person within the Jewish Islamic Christian traditions uh, in the Middle Ages and beyond. Um, so yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I think mean, there's always this kind of uh, need for striking some sort of balance between a, an over mysticization and, on the other hand, an over secularization um, of a, of a right, figure. Yes. Because you know, context does matter. <laughs> you know, it depends how yes. how heavy one goes with contextualism, but context does matter. Um, I, I I'm wondering if. Um, uh, shall we shall we take some questions? I, I know one or two people have asked if they can ask some questions. So, if anyone does does have any questions and comments, we can we can uh, uh, deal with them. Uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, please uh, do go um, ahead. Um, while we're um, uh, waiting uh, for that uh, to happen, um, what what implication do you think? this kind of reading of, of Avicennian epistemology. Oh, there is a question. I'll, I'll, I'll come to mine later. Um, yeah, so someone's asking, I guess, the more general thing, which is what, what are the fruitful ways in which an analytic philosopher can gauge Avicenna? I guess the one obvious one is epistemology that you mentioned. But <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> are, are there other areas that you think you might work on or, or you think yeah. the implications of what yeah. you have presented? Sure. Sure. The, I mean, epistemology, we talked about the epistemology to some extent. Yeah. There is uh, um, another sort of more technical uh, even uh, than that, uh, which I engage in chapter five of uh, the current work, uh, which is um, Avicenna's uh, a metaphysics and his... Uh, account of the unity of being and categorical unity. Uh, and I think this is something you've worked with mm-hmm. also, I know, at least in the context of Mullah Sadra and then beyond. Mm-hmm. But that's, I think, you know, very um, useful, at least from this kind of uh, 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 post-Salarzian uh, right. angle. Um, so that's one, another r- r- fruitful and rich area. Um, but of course, the most important one um, that, that people oftentimes overlook is uh, uh, engagements with um, virtue ethics in um, uh, contemporary analytic philosophy. I think that could be very fruitful if brought into some sort of friction. Uh, you know, unfortunately, as you know, uh, traditionally people are not paying close attention to the ethical dimensions of um, Avicenna and other Islamic philosophers, uh, but that's something that I think can be, uh, uh, you know, improved and, and and engaging with analytic virtue ethicists might might be right. also helpful. I mean, that's interesting because, of course, we, we know there's been very much a revival of virtue ethics, and it's also an interesting um, kind of um, 
area of interaction because as I'm sure you know, um, it, there's a lot of interest in virtue ethics in Iran amongst those who are trained as analytic philosophers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and part yes. of that is very much kind of in uh, inserting um, Avicenna and others into um, uh, uh, into uh, a sort of a dialogue on what virtue ethics might be. Um, yeah. There is the question about uh, Timothy Williamson. It says, Timothy Williamson mentions Avicenna as anticipating the Barkin formula, which has relevance for modal metaphysics. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any, any comments on that? Um, no, not really, but uh, um, obviously Avicenna's uh, uh, account of God as the necessary existence and this notion of necessity and possibility in metaphysics has uh, has a uh, sort of uh, uh, important implication for discussions of moral uh, logic and moral metaphysics in, in contemporary. And some people have worked with that. I'm yeah. not... Um, you know, a specialist in that, uh, but it is a fruitful uh, yeah. I mean, I, I area of... That, um, on, on the logic side more, of course, I, I know Paul Tom has worked on that and, um, and also a, a colleague, at least a, a local colleague when I'm in Exeter, um, Wilford Hodges, who's, you know, retired professor of philosophy uh, and logician. Yes. Um, I've had lots of uh, discussions with Wilfred about um, that, and he's he's very much interested in Avicenna's modal logic, which is one mm -hmm. of the reasons why he's learned Arabic. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I think there are elements uh, elements of that. And um, um, someone, uh, uh, Saleh, Saleh Zaripu has mentioned that um, this is uh, Zia Morahid, apparently. Yeah, Zia Morahid is, yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it kind of takes me back to something a long time ago. Um, I was at this uh, conference in Iran in 99. It was this big Mullah Sadwa conference. Sure. And that's probably one of the times when you had so a huge number of analytic philosophers in Iran from all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the States, from... from uh, and, and there was mm -hmm. some very, very interesting kind of discussions going on. Uh, including uh, Zia Morahed was, I, I believe, one of the organizers of that, sure. of that conference as well. Um, so I, I guess that is there. It's it's a question then of, um, um, yeah, how how we in a sense take that dialogue forward. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think I think you've indicated now in both of your books, kind of uh, uh, trajectories for dialogue and how it works mm -hmm. between, especially within Avicenna. Um, Sure, sure. I guess the question is, Is do you see this really being taken up? I mean, I, I think, um, unfortunately, on the side of those who work on Islamic philosophy, I I don't, obviously, it's too early for the new book. For the previous book, it wasn't terribly well uh, sort of taken up. Um, and, and I think that's partly because of the, the, the subject area. Um, uh, this one will be very interesting mm. because it's bang in the heart of one of the big controversies in Avicenna right now. You know, as you mentioned, mm. the kind of the empiricist versus the emanationist. This is the absolute crux of one of the big mm. debates about what's going on in Avicenna. Mm. And so it'd be really, yeah. really interesting to see that uh, develop. But have you, have you um, obviously, when you speak to your colleagues um, who are analytic philosophers or post-analytic mm. philosophers or Salersians or McDowellians, um, do you do you see that this um, dialogue can really really kind of develop into ways and in, into new ways in which we can do philosophy? Because ultimately, I think it can't just be uh, about historical mm. observations or even mm. uh, yeah. just at the at the level of comparative philosophy. I mean, I, I think there is a sense in which you know how, for example, how do we do philosophy with mm. Avicenna, right? Uh, mm. And is this yeah. something that really we think is has purchase and will have purchase as we move forward? Mm. Mm. So yeah, no, I, I think that uh, uh, that that's uh, uh, is is going to be uh, interesting. How uh, uh, the the so so yeah the 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 main I think issue is that uh, uh, we have to understand you know uh, when we want to have dialogue between different traditions what are we having dialogue between in the sense that, hmm. um, you know, what is it that uh, uh, we are, we are uh, engaging when we are. And so my part of my uh, uh, sort of con I, 
I believe, contribution of my first book was to say, look, if we are just thinking about philosoph Islamic philosophers as just these people who are sitting around and, and turning these sort of uh, logical disputations about different topics mm. uh, without seeing the, the overall, the big, the big picture, yeah. the, the, the context in which uh, they're engaging with, with, this, uh, with this material, you kind of miss it. And you then start ascribing, you know, um, kind of as uh, you know prejudices assumptions religious commitments that yeah. that come into conflict with that so i think that that's uh that's sort of important first step to uh uh but but you know um uh we we don't need to and, and because of the nature of the academic debate uh, uh i i've noticed or i noticed subsequently that we don't need to perhaps uh uh be that preachy to our uh colleagues uh, oh, that yeah. uh, we, we can demand, uh, uh, we can demonstrate um, how this might work and has been working by looking at traditions that, that kind of emphasize the pragmatic uh, dimension of, of philosophy and, and then sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, working it. And, and so I, I bring the, the uh, um, uh, philosophy as a way of life considerations only at the end yeah. um, saying that look you know if you might have found this stuff at all somewhat uh, appealing or interesting it's not irrelevant to you know uh, the other kind of things that 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 are that are happening and um, and and so sorry I got a call yeah uh, no it's okay we're back yeah um, so, so I, I, I do think that uh, uh, this this concern with the the nature of philosophy is is something that you know has been going on, uh, you know, throughout the history of philosophy, and 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 is something that everyone here and there. Uh, it's not just Pierre Hadot who has uh, you know uh, problematized it, but it's something that has you know. Uh, 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 engaged with uh, and, 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 and and that has a, its own context for say Hado's concerns um, say Kant's what is enlightenment uh, Schopenhauer's attacks on university philosophy and oh, and yeah. uh, Nietzsche's uh, picking up the mantle so there's this context in which um, but but yeah so people who are outside of the philosophical uh, um um, circles and and the, but they still have an interest in philo Islamic philosophy may not find that uh, uh, um, those kind of concerns that uh, relevant um, because they're just not you know yeah. familiar with the with the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, sense but, that that that, that yeah, they have. I, I mean, as I say, I, I think that the interesting thing about this book and also the previous book is that it doesn't necessarily have to just be read by philosophers. So it, it can, I think, be mm. fruitfully read by others as well. And it gives, I, I think it really it opens up these very important questions about what the function of philosophy is in society. I mean, it's not just yeah. a historical question about what the function of maybe philosophy is in, in Muslim societies in the pre-modern mm. Middle East, but also mm. like how we see notions around philosophy and irrationality and inquiry and engagement working in, in different societies across the world today. Yeah, yeah, and that, no, I, I agree. agree. I think, yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. really important. I think we 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 have this kind of uh, 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 responsibility as 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 philosophers that that uh, um, ex extends beyond our our limited circles. We need to make philosophy relevant and accessible uh, to the public, and uh, and that's uh, you know. Uh, making that that clear is is an important task and i and i take that seriously being in a in a state university where i i have to do that yes, you know thing is, <laughs> all the time yeah and and as they always say that if you can teach it then you that's you know you really get it <laughs> because you can't find the it. jesuit <laughs> principle right the, yeah. if you want to yeah. learn something you teach it yeah absolutely. <laughs> uh anyway uh Muhammad, thank you very much uh, i think we should draw this uh to a close um uh, thank you for, for joining me and thank you for everyone who's been watching this. Um, this will, of course, um, 
I, I will record it and, and make it available on our on the institute's um, uh, YouTube channel eventually. Well, soon anyway. Um, my next conversation will be um, tomorrow with Professor Andrew March uh, from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and we'll be talking about his uh, new book, The Caliphate of Man, uh, which is on. Uh, a slightly different topic. It, it's on it's on contemporary politics <laughs> in the in the Muslim world, but um, but in many ways, philosophy is not that removed from politics. It's very much a political yeah. issue, as we know, especially in places like Iran, Saudi Arabia, etc. Politics yeah. is very very political. Uh, so uh, this remains <laughs> for me just to thank you again, Mohammed. Uh, thank for you for having me, and uh, I look forward to future conversations uh, like this. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Take Good. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.